okay, it looks like our attendance is leveling off a little bit. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, thanks very much everyone for taking the time today, uh, jumping on yet another Zoom call. Um, hopefully you'll enjoy this session quite a bit. Um, I'm Max Herzog, I'm a program manager with Cleveland Water Alliance. Um, and it's my great pleasure to kick off this session um, about uh, Water Reporter, this really great platform and set of tools that Chesapeake Commons um, has developed and that we at Cleveland Water Alliance have been partnering with. Um, really for us at Cleveland Water Alliance, this partnership started um, with a program that we're working on called Smart Citizen Science. And Aaron, if we could go to the next slide, I'll talk about that really briefly. Um, you know, for, for folks that aren't familiar with Cleveland Water Alliance, we're a nonprofit economic development organization based in Northeast Ohio, but working across the, the Lake Erie region. And our focus is on um, looking at new technologies and how they can have positive impact on our community's water resource challenges. Um, and so the, the Smart Citizen Science program is one that we're really, sorry, I got a car driving by here, that we're really excited to um, be diving into uh, in this first of three years. Uh, and the focus of the program is really on supporting existing volunteer monitoring programs across the Lake Erie region. So in all of these communities, there are these groups that pull together people who feel passionately about their water resources and help them um, collect water quality data um, that's really vital to understanding the health of these watersheds and of Lake Erie itself. And so through this program, we're partnering with what we're calling local champions, um, these volunteer monitoring programs across the region. And you can see some of those programs um, pictured here. And these are the, the communities that we're working with right now. Um, some of you may have actually been on our kind of virtual launch uh, session, which happened just yesterday. Um, we're in the process now of starting to engage with a broader set of partners to understand the needs that other folks bring to the table and look at how we might engage more volunteer monitoring programs, as well as a more diverse set of partners, um, educators, universities, um, companies, and other folks in this effort. Uh, but really throughout all of this, one of the most important components for us has been uh, Water Reporter and this data platform that we're bringing to all these folks. And it's been one of really the biggest value adds for these volunteer programs who in many cases have been collecting and managing their data on uh, physical sheets, Excel spreadsheets, and other, you know, really tried and true, but um, in the, the world of modern data science kind of archaic methods. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to bring um, bring support with Erin and her team um, to, to this space and kind of really advancing the way that we look at managing this kind of data. Erin, um, maybe the next slide. Oh, yes. So, you know, that's just really briefly um, some about the Smart Citizen Science Program and Cleveland Water Alliance. Um, if you're interested in getting involved, you know, particularly if you're, if you're based in the Lake Erie region, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we're really interested in hearing from folks now about, you know, how they might want to get engaged and we're scoping out our partnerships for 2021 and 2022, um, which we'll look at, in which we're looking at scaling the program. Um, but with that, it's really my great pleasure to introduce Aaron Hoffman from the Chesapeake Commons to talk about Water Reporter, this, this data tool that's really been the backbone of this program. Aaron. Hey, thanks for the um, excellent introduction, Max. I feel like I'm going to spend the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes um, expanding on your one sentence there on that there's tried and true ways to manage data, but sometimes they're a little archaic. Um, so the goal of today's presentation is to show you how you can daylight data to make the most out of it. Um, but before I dive into all of that stuff, I thought I'd introduce you to the commons. 
Um, we're a nonprofit tech shop who is um, we're comprised of five people. I'm the only non-developer on the team, so save your API questions for later. <laughs> but um, can help walk you through how we actually use these software solutions um, across the environmental sector. And that's really what our mission is: is to create software as a service um, systems and deliver them to the environmental sector to try to find ways to bring together different people that have very unique problems, but really common barriers um, to addressing those individual problems or research needs. Um, and by creating these universal platforms like Water Reporter, we're really able to leverage the different parts that are holding back some people in the environmental sector from getting the data or doing things with it that the otherwise would be able to. Um, everything that we've built, we have uh, stuck with a few common truths and principles. And that's been really important because with software, you can go in so many different directions. Um, but as we build these systems, especially because we're trying to reach out to a broad audience across a really diverse sector, um, we really try to stick to these core principles. Um, and they probably will seem familiar to you for the work that you do as well. So the first is that our resources are stressed. Not only our environmental resources, but also the resources within the environmental sector, whether it's money, um, in-house expertise, or time. And all of these things are really important to factor into any monitoring programs that you have and what your inputs and outputs are to those programs. Second is data. Data fuels all work. We can only manage what we can measure and we can only respond to what we know. So being able to have data that you can access and that you can maximize use of after you have it in hand is integral to the success of anything we're doing in this sector and beyond. Next, we really feel that shared information is more valuable. The worst thing is knowing that people within the sector have to compete for dollars or time or attention. And so when you're able to have data that you can share and that has a common ground, you're able to do more towards your individual missions, but also broader missions and goals. And finally, together along that vein, we're all champions. And we were really excited when we first started working with the Cleveland Water Alliance and the Smart Citizen Science Initiative, because they were already calling all the groups on the ground doing this monitoring champions. And it's a really great connection because we do really feel that elevating the inputs of community scientists to the environmental sector is paramount to bridging the gaps between what these different um, uh, stakeholders are able to contribute. And data is a huge part in that. Volunteers can do more than just give money or pick up trash. They can really be the eyes and ears collecting data throughout the watershed and on your rivers. And so all of these principles have come into creating this platform that we call Water Reporter. We started this platform over five years ago, and it served as a pollution reporting tool. Um, some of the initial groups that we worked with needed a way that volunteers were able to say, there's something out there that doesn't look right. Can you help us solve it? And we have morphed, we've built from that foundation of geolocated photos to an entire platform aimed to support engagement and productivity for the environmental sector through strong data management and a collection of features that work with collection, storage, analysis, and visualization of data. Um, we now have over 150 organizations that have worked on countless really cool monitoring programs, some of which you'll see today um, and in states across the country. So it's been a really agnostic uh, platform. We're not trying to fit anyone into one way of looking at their watershed or one way to measure a specific parameter of data. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. What we find and what makes what Matt said about that archaic data sheet so important to, to acknowledge is that digitized data can unlock so many doors for you. 
within your organization can help you democratize data, which means give more people access to participating and to um, being able to analyze and understand it. When you have data in hand, you can also influence decisions because you suddenly have something that you can point to and that you can use to inform the statements that you're making to other stakeholders. It also allows you to collaborate better because suddenly you have something that you can easily share. And most importantly, I think, <laughs> is that you can merchandise data that is digitized and that is able to be displayed in really digestible, easy ways, like embeddable maps on your website. Because let's face it, like at the end of the day, we all need to be able to continue to get the funds coming in in order to keep all this monitoring happening so we can keep an eye on our watersheds and improve the natural resources around us. And last but not least, when you have digitized data, like truly machine readable data, not only do you have it in the way that you can make a graph that's interactive, but suddenly if it's more than nice looking on a spreadsheet, it truly is machine readable you can start to plug it into different, um, different other softwares. So if someone else creates a really great regional map, you can easily, you know, maybe tweak it a little bit so that it fits their schema, but you can put your data in too. So you're no longer siloed, right? When you have this machine readable digitized data, you're able to participate and really give the full potential to the movement. And I'm sorry if I sound really, uh, idealistic here, but I have seen the potential of what some strong data management can do to move small and large monitoring programs. And it's really cool. So to that end, here's a great example down in Florida. In 2018, there was a terrible harmful algal bloom that really, it, um, in retrospect now, it doesn't seem like it, but it paralyzed the economy down there. And um, the volunteers for this local group went out and just started taking pictures of those harmful algal blooms. They didn't have a tier three monitoring program or a really extensive plot, but they were able to take this data, bring it to the local legislators, and start to enact change that addressed some of the root causes of these harmful algal blooms. And they couldn't have done that without the citizen scientists or that machine readable data. So when we created Water Reporter, we wanted to make sure that it was accessible to everyone. It's simple and it's interop interoperable. And what this means is that it can um, be fully accessible to you, to the user, but also that you don't have to have a breadth of knowledge on how to do data uh, analysis, how to code, um, or how to build these whole platforms yourself. And you also don't have to have a huge uh, bank behind you trying to recreate a new system every single time you have a new idea for a monitoring program. We've had folks, um, different organizations come to us where they were building custom software application after custom software application every time they had a new monitoring program that they wanted to um, get out the door and engage with their volunteers. But sometimes these things don't last forever, right? Like <laughs> you run your program in some cases and it's done or it, it, it has a long lifespan, but it's not that many people. And you can't put a huge price tag to that every time. You need to, to digitize a program or you stop being able to do it. And that's why we keep this really simple, really interoperable and really agnostic. And what we want to do is once that data is coming in, and we feel like this is, even if you're not using Water Recorder, a, a, a really great um, standard that you should achieve, whatever systems you decide to use, that you should be trying to find ways to make sure that your data is searchable and discoverable internally and to as many stakeholders as possible. And so we've really coded that into our system as well. So Water Reporter consists of a mobile application that can be used by uh, any, anyone that wants to download the app, as well as uh, a back-end um, subscription account for organizations or watershed management groups that want to use all these additional features to collect, store, and analyze their data. And there are some features that uh, push uh, some of the different monitoring types straight out to the public 
and other features that allow you to do some um, creative thinking about how you want to use it and then put it out through embeddable widgets in your apps. So think engagement and think productivity and then marry it together and you have water recorder. And that is really important to us. It's also really important to us that we're working with multiple types of data. Um, and that really uh, allows us to focus on accessibility again. As we said, it's really important that any question you have to monitor, you can try and address through a single platform. And if you're trying to use a separate platform each time or for each step in the process, that's great and it might work for you, but it's probably not going to address some of the resource issues in terms of time or um, cleanliness of the data because you're going to have to constantly be spending more time at your desk cleaning it up and moving it from step to step. So Water Reporter tries to address that quality control aspect and get you more time on the ground and less time in front of the screen. So when I talk about data and in Water Reporter, there's lots of ways to manage it. But what we're saying is that everything that comes into the system, ideally, it can be managed in one place. So you're creating more or less your own data management system within Water Reporter. And that's really cool in, in instances like the Smart Citizen Science Initiative. There's 10 plus groups that have created their own data sources and they're managing their own data in ways that addresses their historical ways of collecting and managing this data. But it's because it's been cleaned and because it's all in Water Reporter, it's quite easy for Max and his team to then pull it out and make use of it for um, regional efforts and for regional goals. And you'll see a map of that in a little bit. The next thing is that you can configure your stations and your scores. So if you're, for example, monitoring bacteria and you have a threshold that if, if the bacteria level counts go above a certain threshold, you can, you can define what that threshold is. You can define what type of bacteria you're looking at and you can create a message from your data to convey through, um, through maps to general audiences. So you're starting to communicate closer to real time the information from the monitoring data that you're collecting. And then all of that station, I kind of just got ahead of myself, all of that data can live in maps on your website, as well as through feeds through Water Reporter, so that you're collecting that quantitative and qualitative data um, through one source. So let's jump into that. Water Reporter supports three types of data. Tier one is observational monitoring. So again, think of this as a productivity tool. When you have a general person off the street comes in and says, I care about the environment. I want to help. How do I help? And you're a small watershed organization or sometimes the state. Um, you might only have really intensive monitoring programs out there. And maybe someone doesn't have time to get trained up in how to, you know, take a water sample and do all of the analysis that they need to do. So you can ask them to go out and find pollution. Um, in this case, there's some harmful algal blooms that people are looking at or um, fish health. And all of that information is actually stored through a uh, schema in Water Reporter that allows the organization that's collecting that data to pull out all of this information or build visualizations flat straight into the system. So you're actually getting machine readable photos <laughs> Um, through Water Reporter, um, through Tier 1. Tier 2 is qualitative sampling. So Water Reporter allows people to go out and get um, qualitative or quantitative information on one-off or on-the-fly locations. And this allows you, again, you can still get those photos that can still be machine-readable, and you can add in more information. Um, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't allow you to do any analysis on it or perform any trend lines. Um, it can just appear on the map as basically a point in time of what was seen and observed um, at on this specific uh, topic or research question. And all of these fields that you're seeing here in qualitative sampling, 
Those are available to be used through digital data collection forms through the Wider Reporter mobile app. So you can start to assign volunteers that you've trained on how to do this monitoring um, to be able to access that map and then share their, da their data directly through Wider Reporter. So all of a sudden, if you are used to having paper forms, you can, you can eliminate that step and have this data arrive directly in your data source. All it needs to do is be reviewed before it's good to go. So you've probably saved yourself a bit of time um, in order in by using this, this system. And I know some people still like paper forms. They feel comfortable with them. They feel tangible and that's fine. We always have a way for data to be uploaded um, into the system without going through that collection process. But, and uh, again, for those of you who um, have a mindset that likes to see uh, the structure behind the system, we do, this is the information that we're collecting from every um, on the fly qualitative sampling. So again, it's pulling the watersheds, it's pulling the coordinates, and it's giving unique information. And then you're able to add all these different fields that are relevant to your specific research questions in your monitoring programs. And tier three is quantitative sampling. This happens to be my favorite because what it does is it takes um, stations, fixed stations, and it allows information to be uploaded or inputted into that station over time. So think of your classic water quality monitoring program here. And um, you want to take that information and share the health of your waterway um, based on the, the parameters like dissolved oxygen or conductivity that you're collecting at each of those stations. Commonly, we've worked with a lot of groups that take all this information. At the end of the year, they spend a month in Excel analyzing it and creating graphs and then producing a report that they send out to their stakeholders, which is great. But the year has passed. <laughs> so you don't know what the water quality was like throughout the year, you know, at the end of the year. So what we've done is we've taken that opportunity to, as that information is collected throughout the year, it can appear on these maps through a simple upload process. And what's more, because it's at fixed monitoring stations, we have a relational database that allows for you to see trend over time. And if you can see, I know it's a bit small there and I apologize, but you can also put on some analysis. It's very basic. It's just based on um, the, uh, uh, numbers, ranges within each perimeter type, but you can start to convey to your audiences what exactly, why exactly they should care about the data. You can say when dissolved oxygen is bad, when it's good, you can do it on an ABCD scale, whatever works for you. We really try to focus on giving you that power for um, your individual watershed and monitoring needs. But what's really neat is that groups like Max's and the Cleveland Water Alliance, when they build these regional platforms and these regional efforts, you can start to find um, commonalities or at least just show different types of data on the same map. So that's how Water Reporter works as a productivity tool. And usually when I start to work with a new group, I give them a really in-depth tutorial about how, how to use Water Reporter because it's really user-led. It's pretty intuitive once you get familiar with the system. I haven't met many softwares out there that are, um, are completely like take it and run with it. But if you've ever looked at an Esri product, um, this is a lot more user-friendly. You don't need to have a whole degree <laughs> in order to figure out how to use it. With that being said, I'd rather take my time right now to give you some examples of how you can take a digital management system, improve your data management processes, and come out with really strong products. And the best way I think to do that is through use cases. So um, I have a handful that I've produced, prepared that um, if anyone is on this call that has done any of these, you will please bear with me because I'm going to simplify them to a um, high degree. But I do also just want to point out on the screen that I've created a little chart on the bottom of most of them to try to give you a sense of which type of data the organization is collecting 
and the level of effort that goes into training the volunteers and reviewing that data in order to um, you know, make something of it. Because at the end of the day, there is going to be a little bit of legwork that's required for any monitoring program. Our goal is that you can focus on what you're really good at, which is coming up with these programs, monitoring and making sense of what the data is. And we can fill in all those little gaps that address the, the problem type, the plus stuff you don't want to have to work on, which is the data management and improve your productivity. So without further ado, this first one is Blue Water Baltimore. And this is a pretty big one um, because we've been working with Blue Water Baltimore um, for, since the beginning of Water Reporter. Um, and when they first started out their monitoring program, which has eight years worth of data, and uh, as you can see, 49 sites, when they started it out, they were doing all their analysis in Excel. And once a year, they were taking that data and they were producing that, that PDF that they were sending out to stakeholders. And this was their big chart. And probably most of you on the call can see right away some problems with it. For one, unless you are very familiar with Baltimore, there's no way for you to know where that, where those research places are, those stations. So yeah, you can see it improved over time, but it's really hard to make any connections or to really help anyone feel connected to the, the, the waterway and the watershed. And a lot of um, small watershed organizations, as I'm sure you know, one of your main goals is to try to help re-engage people in their local communities and really caring about stewarding their natural resources. This graph, it's, it's not helping. <laughs> so uh, Blue Water Baltimore, they're really forward thinking. They wanted a custom uh, web application where they could show in real time the data that they were collecting. So we, they worked with us to create this custom platform. And it worked for a few years. They uh, were updating their data they were putting it in, and then they were noticing that no one was going to the website. And those people that were going there weren't doing much. They weren't, they weren't then becoming volunteers or donating or calling their local legislators, demanding that CSOs were addressed. They were just leaving. And it turns out when we talked to the leadership at the Water Baltimore, they felt that the reason was that this didn't appeal to any audiences. They had their scientists that they were working with that just wanted the raw data. And then they had their public that just wanted to know what they were supposed to know about the data. And this was this happy in between that water science, water quality scientists loved, but it didn't actually get to their target audiences. So now they use Water Reporter. And with Water Reporter, you're able to see in real time those uh, the quality, depending on a parameter, at each station throughout Baltimore. And they upload it every week after they have staff scientists, they don't actually use volunteers, but they upload it every week and they put it on a standalone web property that they've made called uh, Baltimore Water Watch. And um, they're able to update their lab readings and everything measured in the field um, so that it's all in one place. It's really accessible. It's also really user friendly. They have a download button so that any scientist that they're working with can download the data. Um, and that's a feature through Water Reporter. But also a general uh, citizen can come here and actually feel like they're understanding what's being conveyed and messaged. And once they started this strategy, they started moving from telling to showing. They found a lot better engagement in the local community. Um, they've been able to, with their cleaner data, they've been able to connect more with public agencies, the local government, and um, uh, academic institutions. I believe they work with university and high school level um, institutions. But also they've been getting a lot of press and they've been able to get more funding and they've been able to really loop all of this information into their communication strategy more. So it's just a better investment and it's a better use of their time um, for this monitoring data. They also like using Water Reporter because they're able to export it and share it with regional um, monitoring collaboratives as well in the Mid-Atlantic area. 
So that's the one I'm going to go into the most detail with because they, um, Blue Water Baltimore has been working with the commons for a long time. Um, but I have a, quite a few more that I will um, also walk through before I open it up for questions. The first is Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper. They're actually a member of the Smart Citizen Science Initiative, um, but they've been working with Water Reporter for a couple of years now to showcase their water quality monitoring data. Um, but as I mentioned, Water Reporter can support multiple types of data. So while the team at Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper has their water quality monitoring data up and running, they've also been able to test out different scenarios. For instance, right now they're looking at um, observing harmful, possible harmful algal blooms um, and reporting those through that qualitative um, form that we support. As you can see on that map, there's also some little circles. Those are the visual observations that people are submitting. Primarily, they use them for pollution reporting. Um, sometimes it's just to show user engagement. So if they have a, a, a monitoring activity, they'll snap a photo and it shows up on the map. And it starts to make those connections between the qualitative, kind of sometimes intimidating information and what you're actually seeing um, out in there. Uh, but as you can see, there's a high level of effort primarily because you're dealing with, you know, actual water quality monitoring. Uh, we also have, I actually already told you about this one, the harmful algal blooms down in Florida. This is, harmful algal blooms are pretty common, um, the actual occurrence, but also in Water Reporter. We have uh, groups in a lot of different states across the country that are looking at harmful algal blooms. Interestingly, uh, everyone has different methodologies. And they also have different types of blooms. So the system is replicable in that you can take that photo and you can share and start to make a whole cache of your information. But each group that does it, whether it's in Tennessee or Florida, Florida can really tailor the information that they need to collect to their specific program. Um, and that's really important, especially for some of these groups that are sharing their information to the state or to other regional um, uh, regulatory bodies. Um, and as you can see, this one has a low level of effort. They just ask their volunteers to have a region of monitoring and every time they go out, they snap a photo. So pretty straightforward. This is one of my favorites because I'm so surprised in all honesty that it even worked. So in Pennsylvania, Small, bat, small mouth bass are disappearing. And the researchers through the state haven't been able to figure out why for the past 20 years. So two river keepers teamed up together and asked local anglers to go out and take photos whenever they catch a small mouth bass. And they are showing the types of lesions via water reporter. And there was a little bit of concern that anglers wouldn't want to share their special fishing spots, but this has actually been an extremely um, popular uh, campaign where a lot of anglers have been sharing kind of gross photos <laughs> of fish, um, but it's helping the researchers really hone in on where they should be looking further and doing more research. So it's starting to target um, where limited funding should be spent to, to do that higher level research, which is pretty cool. There's a pretty gross fish. And so all of this is what you're seeing on these photos is actually in the app that people can download and scroll through on their own. So you can see some of these things. And then they, their map on their website is just of photos that have been submitted. We also have a group called Friends of Casco Bay up in, in um, Maine where they have a, a robust water quality monitoring program for the chemistry and the bacteria. And they sunsetted having volunteers involved with that. It's now all done in-house with staff. And so they had this really active 30 year um, involved volunteer network that needed something new to do. And so they gave them water reporter and they gave them really clear directions on what to go look for. And this one group over the past year and a half has collected over a thousand posts on all the things that you see here. Every time they get a news article on the information that they've been able to collect through Water Reporter, uh, primarily about like sea level rise and algae, 
they get another huge um, influx of new volunteers that go out and start collecting photos. So they're a library of um, information just showcasing what's going on around their bay is huge. And they get really passionate volunteers that feel that their observations are actually worthwhile and they're really helping um, Friends of Casco Bay to target dollars and strategies for improving, for improving their, their watersheds. And they have a lot of information on their website on all of that. So this is another great one. Um, in the Chesapeake Bay, um, if anyone's familiar with the Mid-Atlantic, it kind of degraded a little bit. And a lot of money went into restoring um, submerged aquatic vegetation to try to bring back all of the aquatic species that were decimated. And um, they had aerial flyovers checking to see where that submerged aquatic vegetation was actually taking root and um, uh, becoming thriving again. But it turned out they didn't have anyone going and checking uh, and doing any ground truthing. So five different organizations teamed up. They got in kayaks and on boats, and they used Water Reporter to go out and like, literally take photos of submerged aquatic, veget aquatic vegetation when they saw it. And they started to finally ground truth all of this research and funding that had been done. They're now in their fourth year of doing this. They've used it with everything from corporate outings, um, from, you know, groups that want to do that as part of their like, volunteer initiative to um, people on private rivers that go out and they um, look in their own backyard. But they're starting to see if their investments are paying off with a final level of detail. And because they're able to um, stick, take that photo, the scientists are able to validate everything that comes in through water. And last but not least, actually it's not last, but um, James River Association is another one that uses that water quality monitoring feature. Um, they have volunteers going out and actually collecting all of the data through the Water Reporter app. And they're using their um, online platform to communicate if boating is okay and if swimming is okay. The way they do boating is actually through USGS um, gauges. And we have an integration so that all of that information can go straight into Water Reporter. So if the flow goes over a certain level, the information conveyed to the general public is don't go swimming, it's not safe. Um, and the same goes for bacterial counts um, for the swimming conditions. So again, they're taking that really scientific rigorous data and they're thinking through what is it that you want to convey to the general public. And because you have that data in a more machine readable in a more accessible format, they're able to do it simpler and with less effort on a daily basis. And last but not least, this is um, where we are right now with the um, Smart Citizen Science Initiative with Cleveland Water Alliance. We're um, max one month in to monitoring, um, but we were able to take all of the historic data for the 10 groups and get it into water report. So each of them now has their own map that they can share with their um, stakeholders, but it can also be displayed on this um, regional map so that you can start to understand where monitoring is happening and how the local um, champions are communicating or how they're considering their water quality to be. And it's allowing for that regional look in a way that you never would have before. And it's been really cool to work with all of them and hear the different ways that they're, that they're thinking about water quality monitoring. So if this is something that you are ready and looking to do, um, there's a lot of ways to kind of take the leap and jump and start um, digitizing and collecting data in more machine readable and digestible ways. Um, if you decide to go the water reporter route, we um, are a mostly fundraised organization. So we are able to offer a really discounted fee to access all of the features that I have shown here. So for $29 a month, you get unlimited monitoring programs and embeddable maps. You can access and download all of your data whenever you want. 
and you can have up to 10 administrative owners, which are other people in your organization um, that may want to use the same account um, so that you can create and then execute any monitoring programs that you have um, through, your, through your own little um, software as a service platform without having to create something from scratch. And if you are a group that doesn't need everything, that's okay. Um, the system is set up so that it's, it's really separated. If you already have a collection process you love, you can avoid that. Or if you're really talented with data, uh, data analysis and you want to export to Tableau or to R Shiny, you can take out that data and ignore that part of Water Reporter. We're here to really support the, um, all stakeholders in the environmental sector and it's our honor and pleasure to do it whenever we can. So that's all I had today. Thank you so much for giving me this time and your attention. And I hope that I can answer any questions that you have at this time. So Aaron, you can refer to the Q&A section. Do you see that? Um, at the bottom of your screen, it looks like there's a couple of questions here. Um, I can read them off to you if you're having trouble uh, accessing it. I found it. I'm good. So the first one is, do you have a published API for this tool? Are you thinking about creating one? If not, that is a great question. We are actually working with the Cleveland Water Alliance to make our tool, our API public. Um, and we're anticipating that it will be completed by first quarter or second quarter of 2021. So it's in the works. And then um, when the data are reported with accompanying graphics, is there any text discussion included concerning data limitations or accompanying quality assurance, quality control information? So yes and no. There's a couple different ways that you can convey that information. In the, um, in the data itself, in, in those like station cards, there are different places where you can enter in your own detailed description information. So some people use that to link out to like their um, um, operating procedures or um, information on what their crop is, or they explain their like why you don't want high levels of bacteria, for instance, or low levels of oxygen. Um, a lot of people also do that outside of Water Reporter. So if they're using Water Reporter as a widget on the web page, they'll explain um, what to look for. So um, the system doesn't have any like built-in uh, functionality directly for that, um, but it, it does have opportunities that you can enter it in if you want. Is the platform applicable to countries outside the US? Yes. So we have had people using Water Reporter I think on almost every continent except for Antarctica now. The only caveat is that we only have the watershed delineations for in the US right now. Um, but if you have watershed delineations for in another country, we might be able to add that in as well. But the, the, the actual processes and the data models will work for all of them. Oh, okay, so next question. Does your data, does your group help with customizing inputs, data outputs around data collection needs? And is there a cost to customizing the platform to fit a monitoring program? So um, yes, we help uh, with customizing for with making sure that you've entered in all of your information, how you want it to look um, in terms of like sitting on screen shares like this and looking at your data forms. Um, if a group wants us to do a more intensive um, build for them of like getting historical data, scrubbing it and getting it into the system, we do charge for that because it can be such a, a um, an intensive time process. To, to get like if you have 30 years worth of data and no one has ever like removed the extra spaces or something to make it machine readable. Um, in terms of customizing the platform 
from a development standpoint, um, that's the type of thing that um, we fundraise for and then build um, as part of our roadmap. Uh, but the system for the most part, um, we can find solutions for a lot of different monitoring programs out there. Anyone else have questions? Am I, oh, am I supposed to? If you scroll down, down, if you scroll down, also there's a few more. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, can a, the program interface with the municipality's GIS system? So right now, because our API is not um, public, the, you would have to export data and then import it. Um, and it would really depend on what you are standing up on your end for. Um, how that would work, but we're happy to look at workflows and stuff. And because of how water reporter is structured in the level of, um, of uh, customization that it has in terms of how you name different um, columns and whatnot in, in what would be like your data upload and your data source, we can probably find ways to clearly um, match schema across systems. We do, some people do it for like WQX or state systems right now. So most likely there would be a good connection that we can use for a state system, especially because all of the data that's um, downloadable does have um, coordinate information in it. And yes, we, uh, the next question is, do we use um, Huck codes for watershed delineations? So we are completely standardized to the USGS's Huck codes, um, the system, and you can pull up everything from Hub 8 down to Hub 12s. Um, and I think that we're looking in when the Hub 14s go live. I might be you know, over my pay grade right now to say this, but I believe that we'll be able to do those as well. Um, so really get to that finer scale. But we do not have um, the ability to rename any watersheds. So if there's like, if, if it's called Lower Cattle Creek um, in the, um, USGS system, that's how a water reporter will display it. Okay, here's the next question. I'm in, oh, we can dismiss them. That's cool. Um, I'm in discussions with a local nonprofit organization that's in oyster restoration to establish regular monitoring for water quality and restoration and to create a report for that information. Oh, that's just a, yes, that would, this would be perfect for that. Um, so, what you can do is you can you can take whatever um, parameters you are doing for water quality monitoring, use water reporter to structure out your um, basically a template, and then either use the collection form or the upload process to um, upload that information every time you do monitoring at the oyster locations. Um, can you speak a little more about the admin features backend, post-processing data, QAQC, organized output data reporting? Yep, so when you create a, a subscription account, you are giving access to a, a dashboard. And through that dashboard, there is a, um, a whole system where any information that comes in, um, you have a chance to interact with. And, um, and play with. It depends on what type of data you are collecting uh, of how it works. Um, it's probably a longer conversation for than you know right now. Um, but to go through like a very quick bullet list, you have the ability on the back end to build your data source. So if you have on the fly monitoring for floods. You, you tell the system what it is you want to collect and it spits out a form and then you collect that information um, via people that you've assigned as contributors. Their information is gonna come in and sit in water reporter until an owner looks at it and says, yep, 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 verifies it. And then it's in your data source. That's on the fly. For um, fixed monitoring stations, that's the one where you are able to start to see trend lines over time. You, um, again, can assign owners or contributors to the data source who can collect data in the field 
or you can upload it through um, a CSV file. Um, and then again, through the CSV file, it's not gonna do any quality control for you. It's going to assume that you've already scrubbed your data. It will spit it, it won't accept it if it's not machine readable. Um, and through the uh, form, if you have people collecting um, individual samples, you can go in and look at it. You can also go in and change information, or if you have like in the field and lab samples, you can go into an existing record and add in additional information so that everything is together for a single um, file of water. In terms of organizing information, uh, the data it eventually all for, for one distinct data source is all going to live together. It's all going to be exported out together and it will all appear on a map together. You can, when you're visualizing it, um, and you can turn on, off, on and off a lot of different features to hibernate stations or to turn off certain years of data, um, but it is not as intensive. We have not rebuilt an Esri product, um, and we have not rebuilt Tableau or other data visualization tools. Um, so it's, it's simple, but that's part of the design and the beauty is it doesn't allow you to, to get too far ahead of yourself. It really makes you focus in on your message. Um, and then one thing that I didn't mention uh, around QA, QC is that any observational data coming in, so the tier one data, it's all um, available through a social network uh, feature. So it'll appear as kind of, if you download the system, it'll make sense. But it's kind of like Instagram or something where you can scroll and look at photos. You can like pictures, but you can also comment. So if you're doing like a species identification or pollution reporting, you can have a conversation in the system that's kind of confirming what you're being told by your, your volunteers. So it's another way to organize data and um, report back to the general public, but also to that individual user because those comments are public. So that was a lot. Um, if you have more questions about that, um, I'm happy to follow up um, and talk about those to specifics. Can parameters be customized as per our requirements? Absolutely. So the system doesn't really know what parameters are out there. Um, it's, it needs to be told. So it doesn't even have a starting list of like, typical parameters. Um, when you build a water recorder data source, you're going to tell it um, beyond what is fixed in the system, which I can um, resend you what those, those uh, fixed data uh, fields are, you can put whatever else you want in there, whether it's pH or dissolved oxygen or um, percent canopy cover. We've seen a lot of different things. And how does your product handle profiling data, such as that from collected from links? Um, I'm not quite sure I understood, like by profiling, I feel like that could mean a lot of different things. I'm gonna take a shot in the dark, but feel free to. They, what they likely mean, Aaron, is like a vertical profile, like top to bottom taking different samples. Um, I may have that wrong, Randy, but uh, that's how I've heard that. Like a what? Yeah, perfect, okay. So this is a great question. Um, last I remember working with someone that did it, what happened was the system showed if you took three samples on one day at, in one sample and you had bottom, middle and surface, it would basically create a separate parameter for each one. So it doesn't look great, to be honest. Um, what we encourage groups that have been doing this to do, and the reason I'm stumbling is because the last one that set it up was year ago, so I'm not as fresh in my memory of it, but they did an uh, analysis of whatever it was. So they collected all that data, but they had a fourth column that was what they had their as their public interface that actually like conveyed whatever it was that they wanted to. 
from it. So the system can collect that quite easily. The tricky part is in what exactly do you want it to display if you want it to have a public facing part. Erin, you do have one question in the chat right now. Um, David is asking, you mentioned using USGS gauge data in one of your use cases. Does Water Reporter do other types of real-time data integration? At the time, no. Um, we are looking into what is doable um, as we do more integrations. USGS was our first test at being able to do that, and it went really well. So if you have a specific source that you're looking to integrate, um, we're happy to take a look at that and see what it would take to make it happen. But we do know it is possible. It just doesn't happen yet. Great. Well, thank you so much, Erin, for taking the time. If that's all of the questions that we have, I think we can go ahead and wrap up. But this was a really great webinar. I know I learned a lot. And thank you so much for joining us this afternoon to everyone and Erin included. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thanks. Have a great afternoon.